Okay. So, oh, meeting is now streaming live. So, hi everyone. <laughs> and welcome to tonight's event, What is Sustainable Travel? And when can I do it? <laughs> so, we are absolutely delighted to see so many of you here and more of you coming in. Um, thank you very much for joining us and a special thank you to Euronews Travel for hosting us on their Facebook page and bringing this event to an even wider audience. Uh, so whilst we're waiting for people to arrive and just to get things going, um, for, for all of us on, um, on the panel, I think it'd be really useful to get to know a little bit about you. Um, so I just want to invite you all to um, say hi in the chat. Um, if you just let us know your name, where you are in the world, and where you would be if there were no restrictions. So where are we all dreaming of traveling to? Where would you go if you had the chance? Um, so yeah, if you wanna start um, that up in the chat, that would be fantastic. Who's gonna go first? Well, I can let you know that I'm Rachel and I'm currently in Cardiff <laughs> and actually if I could be anywhere I might be back in Cornwall where I've just come from today because it was absolutely glorious there um, but if I'm dreaming big I might go to Hawaii. Hi Harriet, Tiffany hi, Tiffany Amber sorry hi. Great. Matty, oh you're in Cornwall. <laughs> Fantastic, you're in Paris. Great. Did I just see somebody's in Antarctica? No, planning a trip. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, so my name's Rachel. I am um, hosting this evening um, together with Catherine from No Fly Travel Club. <laughs> Hi, Catherine. Um, so yeah, I'm the founder of Our Pledge. We are a social enterprise that specialises in sustainability consultancy and support for small businesses, um, including funding via our bespoke pay it forward platform at ourpledge.co.uk. So that's how Catherine and I know each other and how we have been working together and what sort of spawned the conversation this evening. I'll be facilitating the discussion um, tonight. So before we go any further, I just wanna make sure that everyone is comfortable and um, to give you a quick heads up on a few bits of necessary housekeeping. Um, I'm like a thousand percent sure that you're all familiar with Zoom because 2020. Um, so, uh, but yes, please do keep your um, microphones on mute unless you are speaking. Just to say again, um, hopefully you saw this in the event uh, page, but we are both recording and <laughs> live streaming this evening. So um, if you want, there was, it will be an opportunity to participate. You know, you will be able to ask questions, um, but uh, if you feel like you would rather keep your video off to do that, we completely understand. Um, and you can use the, um, you can use the, um, option to um, unmute yourself or you can just put questions in the chat so we'll use either of those functions both are completely fine um, as I say there will be a chance to ask questions of the panel but I actually think it might be easier on us if um, we can save those questions till the Q&A section of the evening so just um, keep notes as we're going along um, and also just to say there will be an invitation at the end as well if anyone has anything that they'd like to share if you um, everyone here with us has anything that you'd like to mention or promote then that's absolutely fine we completely welcome that so again I'll give you a chance to do that towards the end because one of the things that we like to do with our events is to make them interactive not to position ourselves as the um, entire um, we, d we don't know everything and you may have things that you want to share and there are other discussions to have beyond this as well. It's a, it's a live and ongoing discussion for us all and things are evolving and changing all the time. So um, what we are going to do is create a resource out of this that we will send to you um, after the event, which sums up everything that we've discussed. So it will um, give you an overview of the kind of top tips that our panel kind of share with us this evening and any other links and... Um, uh, bits of information that we think are relevant and useful. So um, that will be coming your way over the next week or so 
um, after the event. Okay, I think that's everything I need to say. Catherine um, and Alice, is there anything I've missed? Great. Um, Alice is my colleague from Our Pledge, so she's um, supporting me this evening. Okay, so I imagine that um, everybody is here for probably the, the same reason. <laughs> the enforced stasis of the pandemic has, I'm sure, highlighted how glorious it was to be able to travel and will be again. But I also think, and I've seen multiple reports actually about how the pandemic has made so many people more aware of our impact on nature, on the planet, in what we do and how we might do things again as we move forward, as things open up. And I know that myself and many people I've spoken to are very keen to move forward mindfully and to minimise our impact and to change the way we behave and um, to be aware of the possible negative damage we can do and to be aware of the posit uh, possible positive impact we can have if we just change a few behaviours. And so we are very lucky this evening to be joined by an entirely ins inspiring selection of international panellists who can help us all to um, put our thinking in that sustainability space, in that mindful space, in that positive space, and give us their insight to this question of what is sustainable travel and and when and how can we do it? So um, I think actually what I might do, no, I'll do this first. Let's, let's hear from the panel. I think it would be really useful for everyone here to know um, who we're speaking with tonight and to hear from you all about your area of work and your area of interest and expertise. And then I'm gonna ask the room a couple of questions in an interactive format. format. Um, <laughs> and um, she's heard about the live stream, so she wants to be in on it. Um, but yes, so um, Catherine, can I ask you to introduce yourself, talk a little bit about No, Travel, uh, no Fly Travel Club, um, and also I'd love to know where you would be if you could be anywhere in the world, um, and also to hear from you what the words sustainable travel mean for you. Yeah, completely. Okay, so um, thanks very much, Rachel, for that introduction, and also thank you for facilitating um, today's panel. So my name is Catherine. I'm the founder and director of No Fly Travel Club. We are a tour operator and also a membership club, and we curate sustainable travel experiences. We firstly do overland trips, so all of our trips are flight free. Um, but at the moment, we're also doing virtual travel experiences, which you can obviously enjoy from your home for obvious reasons. That's quite an appealing option at the moment. Um, and through all of those experiences, our aim is really to connect guests with local people and with nature. So the principles are that we have a low uh, footprint in terms of our emissions. We create as much positive impact locally in terms of economic impact, social impact, um, and our guests come back with a sense of having gained some new perspectives. So that might be in terms of local cultures, what kind of good positive work is being done in terms of the local environment. But the idea is really to have those conversations on the ground and for guests to come back not only with an amazing travel experience, but also having learned something new. So that's a little bit about me and uh, what I do. So um, in terms of where I would be, B, no, actually I'm going to talk about, I'll talk about sustainable travel first. <laughs> so um, somebody that I think, I don't know if she's here today, but someone that Nikki knows and certainly a few other people um, may know, a lady called Joanna from Rooted Storytelling posted an article recently that I thought was a really good summary of what I see sustainable travel as. Um, and so what she'd written in this article was effectively to say, whenever we're traveling sustainably, we should be asking, is this story that I'm promoting or this accommodation that I'm staying in or this activity that I'm doing, is it in the best interests of the people who live here? And as an extension of that, is it in the best interest of the land that they live on? And I think that that is a really nice broad way of summing up what I think sustainable travel is all about, because it's not just, um, you know, about 
carbon offsetting or one of these you know individual things that we can do but it's about the whole network all of the different aspects that come together to have a positive impact on um, our world so sustainable travel is obviously the term that we know and use but i kind of feel that it's not always doesn't always give us the best overview of all the complexities that are involved so i think that little quote kind of sums it up nicely and then in terms of where i would be I think I would be in Portugal if I could be. Um, I, I probably might be able to be, but I would still have to pay for many tests and all sorts of things. Um, I would love to be on a train going all the way down the Atlantic coast and watching the sea. That would be very idyllic. Fantastic, thank you so much. And I'll ask you to share that quote so we can put it into the guide. That would be really useful, thank you. Um, Nikki, can I come to you? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Nikki, joining from New York City today. Um, I'm from Trip Kinetics, and through that, I basically help companies, tour companies, um, make their tours better for customers by making them better for their guides. And previously, I was with Intrepid Travel for five years, which is one of the first responsible tourism companies before we were using that word. Um, so just automatically my career responsible travel was always very baked in. So now I find myself often trying to make it a little bit more accessible to tour operators as right now there's a lot of pressure to be responsible and there's a lack of education about what that actually means. And it's actually quite intimidating um, to a lot of businesses in the travel industry. Um, and there's a lack of education on the traveler end as well. So um, you just see both sides increasingly want to do this right, as Rachel mentioned. So in my work, I focus a lot on just simple, small actions that can have a lot of positive impact in both protecting local communities and educating travelers. I would say, to define, you know, sustainable travel, and I, I, I know I have to not do that every time, but I just feel like now there's so many words like regenerative travel is now the new word, right? But for me, I use sustainable travel as a big umbrella term to simply say it's travel that makes a place better and not worse. And any trip can have both positive and negative impacts on a destination in three categories mainly: so economic, environmental, and cultural. Um, so I think it's just being aware of those negative impacts that you're inevitably going to have by your trip. You can't avoid them all, um, but just doing the work to offset them um, with positive impact. And if I can go anywhere, um, I'm Puerto Rican and my spouse is from the island and his whole family is there. And it's been really, we've never gone this long without going home. So we would love, I would love to take him home <laughs> as soon as we're allowed. Well, we are allowed. We're in the US, we could do whatever. Um, but we, when we should go back, <laughs> that's sure. when we're going back. Fantastic, thank you. That's very responsible. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you, Nikki. Um, Carmen, can I come to you? Sure, hello everyone. Um, I'm uh, from Mallorca. I'm right now here in this little island and I run Mallorca on foot. That is a sustainable uh, tourist company and we do a bit of everything really. We do uh, hiking, we do uh, cultural uh, tours, food tours. Um, and well, I think the most challenging thing uh, of keeping travel sustainable might be to know that all the businesses in your uh, line of working, you need to know them inside out, inside out to ensure uh, high standards in terms of sustainability, because you don't know how uh, the products, uh, uh, what they offer. And um, it also tends to require a lot of effort in terms of customizing what the, um, the tour is about, in terms of keeping, minimizing, for example, the transport you use to keep the carbon footprint as low as possible. So it's just uh, these are special efforts uh, towards uh, the people you work with and towards your customers. If I could be anywhere, uh, I don't know if I could choose. I've been waiting for a year and a half, so I would go to five or ten different places at once if I could. But maybe Southeast Asia, that's uh, where I've uh, been last uh, before, just before COVID started. I was coming back from uh, Myanmar and, and Thailand. And uh, well, although the situation there is, uh, is awful at the moment, um, I'm very focused on, on Southeast Asia. I would go to Bhutan, for example. It's one of the places I've, I'm very curious about. But yeah, whenever that can happen, I would definitely 
pack my my things and, and book a trip and go. Fantastic. Yeah, Bhutan is a really interesting place. They have a very interesting leader, I think, don't they? Who doesn't, he doesn't so. measure things like uh, GDP. He measures um, gross domestic uh, happiness. I read that, and that's yeah. what I've, I'm most in love about about the country. It's it's a completely different way of thinking, and it goes um, it ties very well with my values at the moment. So I definitely yeah. want to see it. Yeah, I've definitely heard of them through the New Economics Foundation. So they have some super innovative ways of of being, I suppose. Um, fantastic. Okay, so finally we have Zakia. I can't see you on my screen, but you are there. Yes, you are. Zakia, can I ask you the same questions? Hi. Yeah, I'm here. I also have a crazy cat here um, who's not as well behaved. So nobody's being mistreated. It's just that she's having one of these days if she goes um, a bit mental. But um, so my name is Zakia. I'm based in Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, and I founded and run a social enterprise called Invisible Cities. We train people who have experienced homelessness to become walking tour guides of their own city. And we offer those tours um, as a way to raise awareness around issues that are close to our hearts. So social issues, homelessness, addiction, mental health, um, but as also a way to give people a voice, people who often haven't felt that their voices have been heard and create a connection between our guests, our customers and our guides. So we run tours in Edinburgh, in Glasgow, in Scotland, but also in York and Manchester in England with plans to launch in Cardiff soon. So you'll be able to come on a tour very soon and um, other places throughout the UK and then why not one day um, throughout the world. So for us and for me in particular, um, it's very important that tourism can be as can be used as a force for good but also that everybody is included in tourism in cities like edinburgh for example we talk a lot about um over tourism and you know the fact that certain disadvantaged communities do not get the benefits um or the good sides of tourism and of over of flows of people coming through so you know we often talk about affordable housing, but also where the money is going and how do people that we may not necessarily think about, how can they also be part of that and connect with that? How can they be part of that connection of that um, sector and that conversation? And so maybe it's working in the places um, that work directly with tourists um, and also economically receiving the benefits of being in a city that is attractive to tourists. Um, and also what's very important to me is that when we travel, so whether that's personally or through Invisible Cities, we see the real faces of the cities and the places that we go to. Um, so, you know, a Glasgow or may have a certain image. Edinburgh is, you know, it's a city I fell in love with 12 years ago um, when I was here on the placement for work, never to return to my um, home in France. but. You know, so it is magic, it is beautiful, but it also has issues like every places in the world have. And I think it's important that people are aware of what those issues are because, and they are not only just seeing an idyllic side of it. They are, of course, you do want to see the beauty and, and, and the castles and all of that, but so that we can have a reflection and we can have a think about what kind of actions we can take to to fight a certain issue or or what we can do to be you know helping that community and um, we work with homeless folk with homeless people and that's a very complex issue and um, and certainly one that sometimes you know people say how do you eradicate homelessness how do you even tackle it or how do you approach it and i think it's so difficult because people have diverse stories and diverse issues that unless we tackle it with little things um, little steps, then we, we shall never do that. And I, and I feel it's the same with sustainable tourism, unless it's the little things that we all do, then I don't think, you know, you can even um, tackle the start of the issue. So, um, and in terms of where I would like to be, I'd like to be in the south of France, where I'm from. Um, I think for the weather, somebody in the chat said, I want to, who's, I think it's Fiona Mary, 
Um, I'm with you there. I would like to be anywhere that is warm because it isn't warm at the moment here and uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be for a while yet. Um, but I'm um, in a previous life, I traveled a lot to Eastern Europe um, and Romania, Bosnia, Herzegovina and really, really loved the scenery and the people and, and the countries and, um, and I would like to go back there. I think it was a very good lesson that I learned that, you know, when I went to Romania for work before, um, people in my family were like, are you sure this is safe? Why are you going? Like, there's nothing there that you, why would you even go? And actually, it was an amazing, amazing trip the first time I went. And I feel like, again, you know, places have so much to offer. Um, and I really saw a beautiful, beautiful land and beautiful people. So um, I learned a lot from that experience. So I would like to go back. Um, and um, and as soon as it is allowed, I think I'll plan a little trip throughout um, Eastern Europe on land. Catherine, I think that's, you know, um, which is always an, an amazing experience. I enjoy that a lot more, you know, taking random trains and, and car sharing when, you know, that's okay and safe. Um, and uh, yeah, do that again. Fantastic, thank you. Yes, and I agree with you, as you were speaking, I was thinking actually, what, there are several things actually that come out of speaking with this panel. And I had a chat with the panel the other day and I, I had to sort of zip everyone up because I was thinking, God, there's so much to talk about and I didn't want to um, have the conversation um, without uh, sharing it with everyone who's here today listening. Um, but what I feel from speaking to you all is that the um, definition of sustainable travel is broad. It can be interpreted depending on where you're going, what kind of travel you're doing. And just to shift our focus into that um, space of responsibility, of just knowing that there are impacts that we have and that we can make a choice about whether it's a negative impact or a positive impact and whether we see the real place. Um, the other thing I just wanted to revisit because I wanted to say again, um, and I think it's worth mentioning of you all coming out of the pandemic, our pledge is a supporter of sustainability in the meaning of environmentalism, but also we are here to support and sustain businesses. We've all been through a very difficult time. And so there is something to be said for sustaining you guys so that you can sustain the uh, regions, the the employees that you have um, through your work. So I'm really, really proud to be supporting Catherine, certainly, and to be supporting you all by, by having this conversation tonight so that your work is highlighted and that you can have those positive impacts through what you do as well. So I'm actually going to share my screen because I thought it'd be useful for us all before we kind of dig into different avenues, as there is so much to talk about, to offer the um, participants here with us uh, the option to let us know what sustainable travel means to you. So I don't know if anyone's um, experienced this before, but there is a, let me see if I can share the right screen. Bear with me one second, I'm so sorry. I just closed it down, oh no. Somebody sing a song. <laughs> yes, it's there. Right. I don't know. Tell me. Alice, I'm going to look at you and you let, tell me if you can see my screen. Great. I can't actually see Alice. I can see Carmen, but you nodded. Thank you. Brilliant. So um, everyone who's with us this evening, hopefully you can do this on your phone. If you or your computer, if you go to www.menti.com, it will prompt you to use a code, which you can see on your screen there. And I'd just love to know what is coming up for you um, with this terminology, sustainable travel, as, as Nikki mentioned. But there are lots of different um, ways of talking about having a positive impact, regenerative travel and so on. But what um, underneath the umbrella of the term are you interested in hearing about this evening? And hopefully some magic will happen and those words that you're typing in will appear on the screen and we can get a bit of a word cloud going uh, so that we know what you're interested in. Magic happening, is it? <laughs> I 
did test it earlier and it worked. Yes. Great. I'm going to let Janet in and she's not going to know what's happening. Here we go. <laughs> Social impact, locals. Are those are two topics. Maybe there's more. I'll give it a moment. <gasps> there we go. Awareness, local community, equity, longevity. Great. Conscious choice. Any others? I'll give it one more go at refreshing itself. Okay, well, those are, that's a really good... Ah, oh, here we go. Leave no, Yes, interesting. So I was looking for CO2. I thought that might come up. More specifically, public transport. The only way to travel. Great. Okay. I'm going to go on to the next slide. Oh, more, more, more local businesses. Fantastic. Social impact is large enough to give me the impression that at least two people have said that, which is great. Low carbon footprint again, communities. Okay. Beautiful. Responsible to locals. Okay, so you're all in the right place. Um, okay, I'm got more coming in. All roughly in the same area. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to go on to the next. Oh, am I? No, it's not going to let me. Is it going to do it? Yes, right, okay. I just wanted to know um, as well what are we most interested to learn about tonight? So there's a bit of a ranking here. We can say other. I did it slightly um, quickly, so hopefully I've covered everything here. Um, but yes, you should, if you give in, uh, go to Mentimeter, menti.com again and use this code, it should give you a new um, option and then you can use the drop down menu to rank your um, choices there. And I'll give you a minute. Oh, tips, great. How to avoid greenwash, great. Other, okay, we'll save that for the Q&A. How to measure my impact, brilliant. Oh, how to avoid greenwash, great. Tips, it's like watching a race. <laughs> tips for being more, mo okay, great, great, great. How to ensure I have a positive impact, how to measure my impact, great. I like that how to de define sustainable travel is now in seventh place because we have to find it. So, job done. She's not normally this well behaved, Lakia, I have to say. Um, okay. I will stop sharing. That's super useful. Thank you so much. Um, so, that's great because we will, as I said, be publishing tips. So, you will have a takeaway, um, everyone. And... Um, We'll absolutely be talking about how to have a positive impact and how to avoid greenwash. So, good stuff. I can tick those off the list. Okay. So, I've divided the evening into three categories. The top, um, the first category that we've started looking at is the definition of sustainable travel and then how you sort of like work within that, within the parameters of def definition, greenwash and so on. Then we'll talk about preparing for sustainable travel because hopefully 17th of May being just around the corner, some more, more announcements coming up, um, we can start thinking about what we're going to book and how, and where we're going to go and so we'll talk about that and then we'll get into travelling right now. So, um, Catherine, I'm going to start with you and I'm just going to go straight in for that question of greenwash. How do we know, how do we identify what's greenwash and what's actually doing genuine good? Yeah, so, well, that's quite a big question. <laughs> um, yeah, over to you. I'll just mute myself. You, you can take yeah, it. <laughs> everyone else can help me out in a minute. Um, I think that the one thing that I would say, which is very broad, but I think is a good rule of thumb, is um, if people are greenwashing, 
then they will make sustainability out to be something that is simple and can be easily fixed because that is why they're using it as a marketing tool because they want to be the, the solution to the problem. But I think if you really understand the, you know, the nuance and the complexity of the issue, it's absolutely not something that you can solve with a product or a service. It's a complete mishmash of different things. So if you can see from someone's homepage that they're making very bold claims about what they're gonna do, um, or they're just offering up one kind of solution, like for example, we are carbon neutral and we offset all of our flights, but then there's no other mention of any work, nothing else that seems to be backing that up with some, you know, some solid work, then I would see that as a red flag because, yeah, like I said, if you, are, if you understand and you're interested in sustainability, then you're interested in all the different avenues that that includes. So I don't know, probably other people have something to add, but that's what I would say to kick things off. That's an absolutely fantastic starter because I think just looking a little bit under the lid is a great rule of thumb for so many things, really, particularly with sustainability. It can be just that little hook that people use to, to get you in. And on a certain level, it's great that people think that that's a hook because it's like magnifying that, you know, environmentalism, climate consciousness is a good thing but you can't do it by these sort of like flippant measures. So um, I think, yeah, absolutely. Nikki, I was wondering if you might have other things to add on, on top of that. I, I do, and I feel, <laughs> it's hard to say it without being controversial, but I really agree with Catherine. I almost find carbon offsetting is like a red flag at the surface because I think, and I know we might talk about this later, but that's sort of really one of the few things you could truly measure when it comes to your impact. And so companies check that box because they want to get credit for it. And it doesn't mean their heart isn't in the right place. But again, looking under that leg and doing some more digging, the companies that are willing to do the smaller work that Catherine mentioned, um, they know that's not going to get them a lot of press and PR, but that shows that they genuinely do care about how their tours um, affect the local communities and places. That's perfect. And I encourage and welcome you to be controversial. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> I think we probably need to go there a little bit because it's, you know, um, it's interesting territory. So, and Crystal agrees. I just noticed that she put that in the chat. So thanks, Crystal. <laughs> Carmen, Zakia, do you have anything to add on the greenwashing aspect of things? Well, I'd say that um, obviously, um, wanting to be sustainable it's the beginning and then you know that there's always going to be an extra effort every time you make a choice because you need to look at twice or three times before you make the decision so it's just uh, once you kind of uh, are conscious and and start getting all these tips that we're going to talk about then you easily see what's uh, good for you what can be greenwash what stays fully sustainable or ties in with the values but you have to put that extra effort so that goes within the the being conscious about it and, and having the extra energy that it requires yeah absolutely i think one thing that i would add into this is the um willingness of businesses to be transparent i really support businesses that I've noticed more and more talking about their own supply chain, you know, talking about their, um, their staff, talking about how they work with their partners and actually kind of surfacing that within their, their public profile. And I think that's, um, can be quite scary. And I think particularly if it comes to, um, even like monetary transparency, then people feel uncomfortable. Like, but I do think it's something that, we, that businesses are going to have to get used to because it's, it helps everyone to understand and to, to understand where costs come in, why things you know, have a price. Um, there's a t-shirt company that na its name is currently escaping me, but you can literally see um, where their remissions come from and where their money goes. So the cost of a t-shirt is this because we pay these people this amount of money here, here and here. And I want to say it's called Evernote, but that's not what it's called but if, if anyone knows what I'm talking about Nikki you've raised your hand please go ahead is that correct <laughs> just to just to build on what you've said I think that's actually a really important point about the transparency because actually if you're doing it correctly 
you should be embarrassed to put the transparency up because you're not doing it perfectly, right? Like that's coming up with a lot of diversity issues now. Like people don't want to put how many people of color they employ or how many locals versus expats that they employ because the numbers aren't good. But the whole point is we know it's not good and we have to be brave enough to admit that so that we can then publicly track. So I do think that's a really important point you brought up of like the transparency is like, bravery in this sense for sure and leading the way by and actually um by admitting that we're all doing it but poorly you know like like we, as we've noticed there's so many complexities here and i think we all have to like hold our hands up and um and say you know like we can't do it perfectly but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it at all you know as zakia said we have to do um small things so zakia i can see your hand is raised please go ahead <laughs> Yeah, following the example, I think the honesty of um, raising those issues and and that transparency is so important. And I think sometimes it also breaks down some of the um, misconception that we may have around with a company or even a way a T-shirt, to go back to the example, is produced. Because if it's an area that you don't know, you might think oh, it's supposed to be like that, but actually it's a part of the educational process. And I think that's why it's so, so important. So, you know, how do we pay guides? Is that fair? Um, How does that compare to other sectors? Who are people, who are the people, you know, how, what's the evolution process? Like, what can they aspire if they start on that? What can they, you know, um, think that they can have in a few years time because I think sometimes then we just build up scenarios in our heads um, that are not true Um, and I agree with Nikki I think sometimes you may put things up that you know you're not quite happy about because you're not exactly where you want to be but I think um, having that honesty I think is very very valuable so as a social enterprise we really try to do that a lot when it comes to the social enterprise sector and I find there's a lot of that going on with other social enterprises which is really good because it also enables collaboration because you might look at another organization and be like oh they're really good at that or that's what they're saying they're doing I wonder what it's like and so then you can start you know chatting and collaborating and learning from them Whereas I think in tourism, if we could all have that too, then, you know, that would enable change and growing really. So taking on that example of, you know, saying I'm not 100% perfect, but learning to get there um, so that we can help one another. For sure. And I also think there's a really important um, aspect to sort of not to say expectation lowering, but that you know, to be a good environmentalist, you start by just being aware that you're a bad environmentalist, I suppose. And you don't have to kind of, um, do you know, like, it's not like um, there's a bar and if you don't meet that bar, then you've failed. You know, you've succeeded just by trying and then by trying again and learning and getting better. And I think, you know, there's like this heaviness that comes with climate consciousness and, environmentalism that you know these issues are so big and the stories are so sad and actually the stories of the guides that you support Zakia and the people that you work with Nikki and what's happening in Mallorca Carmen with the people that you work with and the tours that you're doing Catherine and the positive impacts that they have are such positive stories and you know that you enable people to have that experience and to have that impact um, and to tell this as a um as an uplifting movement to be a part of. So um, I think that is worth sort of um, mentioning as well. You know, this is a, this is a great way of being. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay, so um, I'm just thinking about the time, 20 to eight, and then we wanted to, okay. So, um, Let's talk about some positive things, actually. Carmen, I'd love to hear from you because we had a short discussion and I stopped it short so we could save it for this evening. But I know that in Mallorca, you have some really good news stories about um, how tourism is um, having a positive impact. Can you share a few of those with us? Yes, uh, sure. I'm happy to. I'm happy to promote also the island because I think um, 
sometimes it's viewed in a very partial way and uh, we think of Mallorca about uh, the, the beaches, the sand and uh, summer, but there's so much more and there's already uh, very nice success stories on, on uh, sustainable travel here in Mallorca. Uh, for instance, the, well, the one that comes to mind and, and is uh, quite successful already is um, cycling. There's a lot of uh, uh, cyclists coming in, in uh, the non-summer uh, season, so out of the season and, and that also, well, that is already something sustainable because we have a problem here uh, on, on the social uh, bucket on, on sustainability. That is that the work is, is so seasonal, it's not really sustainable for, for uh, local communities. So this uh, tourism would uh, come, would use uh, the um, roads that we don't use so much anymore because it's uh, we use uh, higher and newer roads. The, the small roads that connect uh, to, uh, towns and they would cycle on those ones. So it's something infrastructure that we already have and is there and is uh, not used so much. And uh, now there's a kind of tourism that can enjoy it and uh, would just uh, be um, based on small towns rather than the city because it's easier to start a, a path from, from the small town. And they would stop in the little bars and restaurants along the Sierra de Tramontana, for example, that is the big chain of mountains that we have is a heritage site and it has uh, wonderful views. So it's already very successful. It has been going on for many years. I've just looked at the numbers to be able to say something and it surprised me even. Uh, it says that it has, we already have, and that's before COVID, uh, 150,000 to, uh, no, 150,000, uh, yes. Uh, to 200,000 people a year just in Mallorca coming to do uh, cycling and that's uh, tourism very interested in, in sports but also would come to Palma and will have the, the cultural tour. And so, amazing. <laughs> yeah so that's that's already one amazing thing that it's happening and, and we're putting a lot of effort in having active tourism so uh, other sports that can be done in, in this uh, wonderful uh, chain of mountains. There's already a lot of uh, diving schools promoting that kind of tourism as well. And so, yeah, so, so much fun and yeah. excited to be here to promote it, so. Yeah, actually you just said something that I was thinking is interesting as well, because I suppose, I imagine that the cycling aspect of tourism in uh, Mallorca was not necessarily labeled or positioned or, or done because of sustainability. Or, or was it? No. No, I don't think it started that way. I think it was uh, locals would uh, enjoy it and then it would become something more uh, known as a, on a national level and then it just happened. And, and now they realize of the potential. And when they have the numbers and when they see how it works and when they see the, the great impact it has on, on social communities and on, economy, on an, an economy level as well, that's when they react. So now it's uh, everyone is conscious and everyone is promoting it, but it was just a natural uh, evolution. So, Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And that yeah. that reminds me of something that you said, which I wrote down when we spoke, which is about a mature tourist destination, mm. sort of learning sustainable practices as it okay. as it goes. And it's a real testimony to the potential of anyone or anywhere to evolve. And grow. Um, so it's the I only just... way forward. So there's no yeah. planet B. We all know it. And and uh, tourism is is our economy in Mallorca. And uh, the only way to make it forward is to make it sustainable. Because otherwise, we're just gonna run out of resources, and it's not gonna be a good way of living. Obviously, the uh, environment is not gonna sustain it. So everything points that way. It's obvious. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, other panelists, can I? I'm just going to open to you for your kind of positive experiences of sustainability, kind of stitching its way into the tourist, the tourism experience. Um, I mean, Catherine, actually, I'll ask you directly. How, you know, obviously, you've set up a sustainable travel company. You know, what was your journey like? What were those kind of evolutions for you? And um, and what have you seen through your, your history in travel? Because I know you've worked in travel for a while now. And so you've kind of seen this evolution and, and have, like Carmen's saying, recognised that this is the future. So uh, tell me a bit, 
a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's interesting, actually, because I feel like it's the the journey that my career has kind of taken mirrors a bit what Carmen was saying about the destination. You know, you kind of, you start with, you know, you just do what you want. And, and I, I was working in a, in a student travel company, which happened to be a rail travel company, but I wasn't doing it, you know, because of the environmental benefit of that necessarily. It just was a job that I fell into and I, I ended up, you know, getting really involved in, in rail travel and, and finding that it was a cool way to travel. Similarly to what Carmen said, like the locals enjoyed cycling, so they just did it and then it became a thing. Same with me and, and train travel. I just started to enjoy it. And then towards the end of the time when I was working there, I, I was having this nagging feeling that we're not really maximizing the potential of this because it's such a, it's clearly a more sustainable way of traveling. But because we were a student focused travel agency, we weren't really digging into that. Um, and I, in the end, got frustrated and I also moved to Intrepid, which is how I know Nikki. Um, and um, through working for Intrepid, I obviously became aware of, of all the ways that you can use um, travel as a force for good and not just, um, you know, in, in the sense of offsetting your flights or, or your activities, but also in engaging with destinations like Mallorca or like wherever it is to find solutions locally which you can bring people to and then amplify because a lot of the things that you know we're concerned about they're issues that everywhere faces and tourists come to a destination and they're sort of looking you know as if they're outsiders but realistically most places are facing the same issues back home so if you can bring people to a different place they see with fresh eyes a solution that somebody else might be might be having like for example you know encouraging cycling tours or whatever then maybe they'll take that back home and they can apply it where they live so i started to feel that you know this way of of traveling is not just a it's not just encouraging sustainable travel it's actually just encouraging a better way to to live and to do things generally so um that was why yeah when the pandemic happened i felt that I, I had these two kind of areas that I could bring together and that both of them were really, you know, natural partners because why would we make positive impact in the destination but fly 3,000 miles to get there? It doesn't make sense to me. So that was the reason why I thought, you know, why not use this opportunity to kind of have a reset and then come back to it with fresh eyes and think, yeah, why, why not go by train? Why not invest in local economies why not do things in a in a slower and more responsible way I don't know if that answered your question that was a bit of a ramble <laughs> it does no it does and actually it um it sort of brings me to a point that I just to pick up on Nikki's um controversial sort of tip like what about flying <laughs> I mean we've all spoken about places we'd like to go I mean I so I'll use myself as an example I have family in the states I am going to have to fly to get there. Maybe I should not put you on the spot for this, Catherine. I'm going to come to Nikki. But what? how do I manage that? Because I think it's something that's going to come up for everyone when we think about sustainable travel. It's like, oh, but I kind of want to go to a place that's, like, far away. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that's why I really, that I try and go by more simply positive and negative impacts. Because I try really hard I don't always succeed I try really hard not to shame people for their style of travel um, you know if you only this is more specific to the U.S. than anywhere else in the world but if you only have one week off the entire year um, and you only get to go to Europe once you know you do want to visit 12 cities in five days and you can only do that currently through a bus if you're not comfortable with driving and um, a bus tour is easily accessible to people who aren't, you know, the people on this call were most likely a certain kind of traveler, and that is not the average traveler. So we're in a very small bubble. So I, I want those travelers to feel included in that. So I do think it's important to me to say, like, look, if you have to fly, fine, but then maybe you're going to offset that, right, by, okay, that's an environmental negative impact. So maybe you're going to make sure you, I don't know, that you only take public transportation once you get there um, to offset that. And is it equal? Maybe not. But it's just that consciousness of what else can I do? Or, okay, maybe environmental, there's no way I can do it, but I can do 
cultural things, right? I can book a local tour guide who, and they give a tour where they go to visit, I don't know, Mayan women who are making textiles, you know, whatever it is that you can like mix and match those categories. I always give the example, it was canceled due to the pandemic, but I was due to take my very first international vacation with my in-laws um, and my, my family. And it would have been, you know, them, me as someone who works in travel, and them as um, my spouse and siblings who have never been to Europe. So they wanted to see the Eiffel Tower. They wanted to see Sagrada Familia. And I learned very quickly that I couldn't be like, oh, I'm not going to the Eiffel Tower. Like that's snobby. Do you know what I mean? Like they've never seen it. They should get to see it. And his parents wanted to put everything on their credit card points, which meant we had to stay at hotels that they could use the points on. So there were all these limitations, but it was a really interesting experiment to say okay to those things but then say, okay, but when we see Sagrada Familia, we're gonna book a private local guide and we're gonna see, even if it costs a lot more money, we're gonna pay to see it off hours or you know whatever it was going to be. We're gonna book you know Barcelona fine. We're, we're gonna book um, local food tours with a company that I know is locally owned. It's just, I think we do need to bend because then I think no one will want to take this journey with us if we have these very strict rules. So I'm all about balancing it. Fantastic, thank you. And Catherine, I can see you nodding and I feel badly that I cut you off. <laughs> I don't know if you had anything else that you wanted to add. No, I just, I agree with Nikki and I, and despite the fact that I've set up a company that doesn't do any flights, I also don't, I don't agree with telling people that they should never fly again. And that's kind of not what I'm about for setting up the company. It's purely to offer the option and fully appreciate that you can also, you know, you can have a positive impact in other ways. And as Nikki said, you don't, being exclusive is not the way to bring people with you and to have a big impact. I think we do need to bring people with us. So yeah, shaming is not the way to do that. But I hope it's a positive, you know, providing a positive option is a good way to add extra things that people can do. Absolutely. And I feel like with No Fly Travel Club, what you're offering is like it builds in everything that Nikki's mentioned in that you automatically just to give people a window on what Catherine does but your your tours are already set up so that the um, experiences are local the food is local the um, yeah what your the way that you travel is has a, a lower impact and to remind people that train travel is quite glorious <laughs> and and a very enjoyable way to to navigate and see new places slowly you know I forgot about the term I had had forgotten about the term slow travel until we were talking about this and somebody I spoke to said oh slow travel fantastic you know I've been a fan of that for years and I thought oh, yes yeah, slow travel you know again the pandemic has kind of woken us up to maybe take you know things can take some time and that's okay <laughs> so um, great thank you so much um, I think one of the things that came up in the Mentimeter um, was about um, the, you know, and we've just touched on in what Nikki said and, and, and Carmen and Catherine, and I want to come to Sakia because like really you are looking at localism from a really specific and unique perspective from the true and sort of, um, I guess, fully three-dimensional stories of people who come from a place and have experienced a place. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that and what, what positive impacts you've seen from your work with Invisible Cities? Um, yeah, I think we, so what we do and, and what we try to always promote and highlight is that everybody has a different story and everybody ultimately is different from one another, but is exactly the same too. Um, and I think there's a lot of beauty in that. And unless, so for me, you know, my experience before setting up Invisible Cities was I worked with another organization called the Homeless World Cup. And um, so using football, soccer um, to support people who were homeless. Uh, and as somebody who has absolutely no interest in sports in general or football in particular, um, my role was very to, to very much to focus on stories and to listen to people and hear 
why they at one point in their lives needed support and um, how sports was helping them and what else could help them. So it was a very privileged position to be able to travel from place to place, places like Romania, Bosnia, you know, but also Mexico, Indonesia, and hear those stories and realize that, of course, it's very different to be homeless in Scotland than it is in Mexico. But at the same time, everybody had the same feelings about it. You know, they felt like maybe at one point they were ashamed and at one point they were stigmatized. But at the same time, they had loads of skills to offer and loads of positivity, loads of dreams and loads of funny stories. And I thought, you know, this is my privilege to be in that job. But if it wasn't my job and I would just be traveling to those places without having to do that, I would really be missing out on all those stories. And starting from this, um, I think, realization is what led to creating Invisible Cities. And so it's putting those stories first and those skills and those motivations. And then at the end of the day saying, people are just people and we should treat them as such, which is very relevant when you talk about homelessness, um, but also about everything else, you know, whether it's the person who works in the five-star hotel that you're going to, or whether it's, you know, the customer, if you do work in that five-star hotel or whatever. And internally, we use it a lot when we work together because we have a varied group of people with different experiences and coming from loads of different countries sometimes and even internally like you know some of our guides between themselves may have stigmas and misconceptions and you know sometimes comments that are not quite nice and and so we do a lot of work when it comes to being respectful and understanding and and all of that and I think all of those values we try to put on our tours um, some recently somebody asked one of our guides do you really enjoy working with other people who have the same experience as you, who've also um, experienced homelessness. And he said, no, not really. <laughs> he said, it really depends because some people are nice and some others are not. <laughs> he was like, it's, it's like working with anyone. I really like some folk and I really don't like others. And I thought this is actually the best answer because he always goes back to this core, um, which is, you know, it's not all great because we've all experienced homelessness. Um, but obviously, so we work a lot on confidence building and using all the skills that you need to be a guide, you know, public speaking, body language, being a leader of a group, whether it's two people or 25 people um, and embarking on that journey of having that confidence to do that. And, and we have a lot of people who, when we meet or, you know, at first can't look at anyone in the eyes and are like, no, I can never be a guide. I can never lead on a tour. Um, and then slowly by doing, by doing it, end up being great public speakers and great representative of their own communities. And we have great examples in all of our cities. For example, Paul in Edinburgh is um, somebody who is homeless maybe 10 times throughout his life. Um, but now, you know, is employed full time by Invisible Cities, but also by, no, he's not employed, but he works with the Edinburgh Poverty Commission. So he gives his opinion on things and he speaks publicly at events and often says, you know, if you told me that two years ago, I would have thought that you were mad because I would have never seen myself in that position. But it doesn't need to be that big. It can just be, you know, people who embark on the journey do the tours and enjoy that connection with the guests and that change and that does change people's lives and I think that's what I try to say as the person who maybe sits a little bit on the outside and, and runs the organization it is very important because it brings people you know um validation in what they do and all their efforts and hard work but also understanding that others are there to support them a great example of that is sometimes when I do talks or when I um, and I have to say it's a lot of American companies or organizations will often ask, is it safe to do a tour with invisible cities because will you take me into a dark alley <laughs> where it's quite unsafe to go or in a neighborhood where really I shouldn't really go. And I always flip the question 
by saying that the person who feels quite unsafe when they start is the guide. Because when you're on the street, you get spat on, you get kind of pushed about and people kind of mock you. And in a lot of cases, when our guides first deliver their first tours, they're very nervous around what people, what guests and customers are going to say to them. And if they are a no-show, for example, which we know happens, it happens with everything, then they often think it's because people were not that bothered about them and didn't want to do the tour with them. And so it takes a lot of reassuring to say people wouldn't pay a ticket. People wouldn't give you two hours of their time if it was to make fun of you, you know. So I think it's um, as simple as bringing that confidence and that dignity to people or as complex by providing, you know, more economical empowerment and of course helping people into housing and into careers, you know, and into going back to college full time, which has happened with with a lot of trainees and a lot of guides. Fantastic. I, I love the example you gave of um, the honest response <laughs> because that speaks again to transparency because I do feel like if somebody is honest, even if it's maybe not exactly what you're expecting to hear, that engenders a sense of trust. I feel, you know, like, I feel like I'd trust that guide. You know, he's going to tell me what he thinks and therefore that's going to be reliable. And so I, I enjoy that as a kind of a uh, little metaphor for the transparency discussion we're having. So I'm assuming that people could come on an Invisible Cities tour now. Yes, yeah, you can in every in all our cities. It was the case um, in England, a little bit before Scotland. Yeah. Um, but now we're limiting to small groups and small parties, but um, are it's also happening. opening that up. Um, right. And you can also come on a virtual tour um, with Invisible Cities, which has been a challenge because technology is not our, our biggest strength, but you can now do a live stream tour. So we use Zoom again, um, but also different online platforms to do it, mostly in Scotland, because that's dependent on the guide's abilities and you know whether they take up technology learning yeah. and skills or not but we're hoping that this year by the end of the year you'll be able to go on a virtual tour in all of our cities and definitely on a face-to-face -to -face tour um already so yeah great well that's a teaser for something we're going to come to because i do want to talk about virtual tours um but i just think in in um, advance of the next sort of um wave of announcements that we're expecting, we're anticipating, and I'm just gonna open this up to um, Catherine, Carmen and Nikki. What what can we start doing now? Like, what, what should we have ready? Like, I mean, let's assume we all really wanna go somewhere else as soon as possible. What can we be doing now to kind of get ready for that, to be um, setting ourselves up for like a mindful trip and to make sure that we don't just get like super carried away and book something without like checking ourselves. So uh, anyone can jump in on that because um, it's a broad question, but I think I can, I can just feel in so many people I speak to this like hunger to go somewhere. And I feel like, okay, let's just pause and think. And what would you say is that little checklist, Catherine? Yeah, I mean, I would say that there is a temptation just to kind of jump back in and think, right, I need to make a split split second decision because the government's going to change the advice and I'll just hop on a flight tomorrow and I'll go to a beach resort and that will be something that is easy and, you know, I won't have concerns while I'm away. But I guess I would say, I mean, I don't think there's any way to get away from the uncertainty at the moment. Whatever type of travel you book, you are going to face obstacles. Even if you go to a green country or whatever it is that um, the government decides to change to next week. Um, they, they, there are a number of hurdles that you need to go through. You need to have your PCR test before and it's quite a lot of expense. So if you, know, if, if you feel that you would like to be more mindful and you would like to use this as a chance to kind of reset, then if what you want to do is, is change where you put your money and your time and, and your resources, then maybe use this time to book something for next year or you know sometime in the future which will give you time to think about 
have some time to save up. Probably you only have to put a deposit down for now, so you don't need to invest so much in it. And then you can really do the thing that you want to do and you can start looking forward to it and you can commit to doing it. Because I think, you know, we all like to have something to look forward to. And at the same time, it's just good to have put some money towards something that you believe in and feel that, you know, that's what I want to do and I've booked it now. So even if it's a year away, I've got that commitment in my diary. Um, and obviously things like the campaign that we're running with Rachel is a really good kind of risk-free way to do that because um, if you go to our pledges website, you can buy a voucher for travel and you don't need to you know, confirm the dates and things like that. And then you can just redeem it within two years. So if there were more things like that, I feel like that would help more people to kind of make the commitment because I do understand the uncertainty at the moment. But I would add the caveat that the uncertainty is everywhere. So you might as well be uncertain about something you believe in. Yeah, here, here. thank you. I think that's very true. And um, and yes, I will echo that invitation to um, look at ourpledge.co.uk because we are supporting Catherine with a campaign whereby you can buy a voucher now. And, and the, un the, the my understanding is that as soon as restrictions are changed and you feel confident that the, what you're offering will um, be plausible and possible, people can redeem their vouchers at any point, right, Catherine? Yeah, great. Carmen, how about um, if we want to come to Mallorca or what, should, what would you recommend that we do um, now as, a, as we start to plan our next phase of travel? Well, um, anyone that wants to travel, I'd say uh, now that is still uncertain if they want to train their sustainable mentality and mindset would be to travel locally, at least for now. That's uh, obviously always going to have a good impact and there's so much around us that we already don't know and uh, so it's it's good to be a local tourist tourist for for a while uh, i'm doing that in in spain at the moment so uh, and uh, whenever that's possible uh, yeah just to spend maybe this time uh, of excitement about traveling to explore what you could do in the place that your uh, your desired destination and see what's there that is of your interest but is also sustainable so do the little research on on, on the company or, or the places you want to visit or if you don't uh, have that much time available because maybe you're uh, working and and your lifestyle hasn't changed much uh, you could uh, attend uh, one of the uh, you could uh, visit Catherine <laughs> and and have a trip arranged by her so any um agent that is uh, focusing on this kind of products will save you so much time and still point you in the right direction so your trip is meeting all these uh, uh, ticking all the boxes and, and you're ensure that you're sustainable from from the beginning fantastic and in the meantime we can all practice cycling so that when we come to Mallorca we can do a cycling yes. tour. it's it's tough if you want to go to the mountain so you have to be fit. right <laughs> the mission starts now that's right great and Nikki what would you say I a thousand percent agree with Carmen and local travel. It, that's it's so important, and tour operators' guides are really hurting financially right now. And there are some places in this world that are not going to open anytime soon. And they are places like Italy, where there is zero domestic market for tours. Um, so in those places, I mean, like Carmen said, you'd be surprised. I back in my tour guiding days, I used to run a tour of Times Square. And it was always my goal to get New Yorkers on the tour. So I said, just try it, just try it. Because, you know, when you're a local, you never, like, you can actually go back to the places that are recommended. You can actually use the tips and tricks that a tour recommends. So I would recommend, you know, looking up your local tour company, even if they say they only, you know, do tours in English, they'll speak the native language, like book a local tour of your own city and just help out the tour guides. And I promise it will be fun. And also virtual tours. And that's like another area, greenwashing isn't the word, but it's it's really across the board how much money guides are actually making from those. So that's a whole nother topic, but that is a great way to support guides right now and moving forward. Cause I, I'm a huge fan of virtual tours because guides are so limited in their pay earning capacity because they could only be in one place at one time. And virtual tours is just 
a slowly opening door to more futuristic ways of traveling. Um, you know, audio tours and pre-recorded tours that I think it's going to really help guides in the long term to, to make a lot more money. Yeah, absolutely. Can you just um, kind of expand on the term virtual tour? Like, Zakia, you gave us a bit of an insight there. But what, like, if I, let's say I'm going to go on a virtual tour, what does that mean? <laughs> so there, here's the thing with virtual tours right now. It's brand new to the tours and activities sector, right? It's existed for a very long time in the virtual reality world. Um, but for us, it's very new. And you have companies, most companies that have done it as a reaction to the pandemic. So it are companies that are not set up for technology necessarily. As Zakia said, you're dealing with guides who are not usually tech savvy. It is a totally different skill set. Um, so it ranges in quality and production value from, you know, companies, you could do it in, I've taken amazing Zoom tours. It's not to say those aren't great, but that's one end of the spectrum, right? A guide using Zoom and screen sharing. And then the other end of that spectrum, you could say you have Amazon Explorer who were doing their trips before the pandemic. This has been in development for years. And, you know, it's Amazon, so there's that caveat, but they're like super fancy technology. Reachable is another company that does a really cool like 360 live video combined with a live tour guide and maps and clicking buttons. And so there's a range, but the issue is because there's a range, I think from the traveler perspective, it's very hard to wrap your head around what is a virtual tour because there is such a diversity in experience. And so the pricing is kind of all over the place. And this has been a really big issue for guides because at the beginning of the pandemic, again, as plan B, um, tour operators were very happy to do 10 euro, 15 euro, you know, just to throw some money to their guides, just to keep their customers interested. But now a year and a half into this, okay, a customer has taken all the tours. So they don't want to take that one anymore or they want to try a new place. So these platforms that have now popped up, especially, um, have just been down onloading as many guides and tours as they can, but the customer base hasn't changed, if that makes sense. So now there's less people taking the tour. So now that same guide giving that tour at 10, 15 euro, maybe two people show up. And to a guide, you know, this is a very, very, very general uh, amount, but, you know, a private guide being paid by the hour, not private, public, I don't know, you're getting at least 60 you're an hour to much higher than that. So, you know, 20 euro for an hour of your time is, is not worth it. So it's, it's really tricky. And I know this isn't giving an answer, but just to kind of be aware as a consumer of virtual tours, like understanding the variety and understanding how much the guide is going to make. There are platforms out there that are, you know, tip based and the guides are getting the tips, but then, you know, 40% of that is being taken out to the platform. And that's not aware, like you don't know that as a consumer, you know, so you just, they're amazing. Please support them. But like do some research, I guess, is what I'm saying. For sure. And I guess like even if the information isn't publicly available, you can ask, right? Exactly. exactly. And I would ask these questions like and even if they're maybe not going to give you the answer you need, like the more companies and this is just a general statement, the more companies getting emails from travelers asking about how much they're paying their guides. Are they hiring local guides? Are they supporting local businesses? The more they get that, then it'll click that this is important. Right now, tour operators do not think this is something consumers want because statistically it hasn't been. And that's changing right now. But even now, like the numbers are, you know, is this important to you? Yes, no. But it's not asking, would you pay more for this? Or, you know, so I think the more we can let companies know this is important, the more willing they're going to be to put in these efforts that we've been talking about this whole time. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I think pushing the conversation is is really important. And also that's interesting to know in terms of lack of market data. So maybe there's some market research that needs to be done to have those conversations with um, potential travelers, virtual. Or... Yeah, with, with the bus tour travelers, with the cruisers, like these are who need to be included in that survey to get a more accurate depiction of where the education level is at from our perspective. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. I just muted myself by mistake. Um, so I'm aware of the time and I do want to open out to questions. So I'm, I'm going to ask you a question now that I'm going to come back. I don't want the answers, but I do want to know at the end 
what you feel is the most positive change that's happening in the sustainability, regenerative travel, responsible travel arena at the moment? Just to put that as something like, what should we be watching and what's, what should we be getting excited about, even if it's future? So I'll leave that with you um, to think about. And I'm going to open up to um, the audience to um, ask any questions. So please feel free to use the chat. Um, you can also use the hand raise option. Um, so you can use um, in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you should be able to see reactions and there's an option to raise your hand like so, and I will then see it. Um, so if anyone has any questions that you'd like to ask either with your voice or with your um, fingers in the chat, then please um, go ahead. Unless we've answered everything, you're here to, <laughs> to um, find out. In the meantime, I'll have a quick look at the chat. It's very hard to, to host and read at the same time. So Matty says, I'm advertising my tours on Airbnb at the moment and you have to guarantee the tours to run with a minimum of one person. And then Airbnb take a big percentage. Interesting to know. Okay, it's really difficult to juggle the pricing, right? Well, if that's something that you wanted to talk about, Matty, then we can maybe open that up or here we go. Amanda says, can, hi Amanda, uh, can sustainable travel be affordable? I've always found the options very expensive, nodding vigorously from the panel. Uh, can it, can it be affordable? Catherine, go ahead. I see your hand, Ben Zakia. <laughs> yeah, it's a very difficult one, I guess. So my, my feeling on this is that there are two costs involved in a in something there's the cost to the consumer and then there's the real cost which is the cost that the you know the the company is is paying and what you want to um find if you're booking with a with a sustainable travel company is that the two costs are not too far apart right so most of your money is going to the local destination and i don't think that it does have to be really expensive but a lot of that depends on how many people are in the middle sweeping up extra bits of commission because something I think this is a thing that people in the travel industry know and it's how the travel industry works but I don't know if people you know travelers themselves always realize you can be dealing with three or four or even five different companies in the middle between an actual guide um, or like a accommodation provider let's say and the person that you buy from so if you want to make sustainable tourism affordable you have to make sure that there are a few as few middlemen as possible so that I mean that's why we always try and go direct to local companies to try and make the the true cost as close to our consumer cost as we can um, and I would just say I mean that doesn't necessarily mean that everything is you know really cheap because on the other hand we have to balance the, the true cost when you're paying people fairly and when you're taking account of potentially more expensive recyclable materials and all these other things. But at least you know that most of that money is going to the local place. So I don't think it needs to be, if you're paying a thousand pounds a night to stay somewhere, most of that is not going to the local people. So yeah, I, I it's a bit of a complicated one, but I'd say no, it doesn't have to be. Um, just try and look for places that seem to be booking more directly. I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> Amanda, is that, yeah, I can see a nod. Thank you. Um, I was going to say something else then, which was, um, I guess also about not being, um, like about traveling maybe less often, but more mindfully, so that your expenses are um, deliberate and like I was thinking, I mean, even just with the restrictions lifting and leaving the house, it's like, oh God, suddenly I've spent money that I wasn't spending before. And that can happen when you're traveling so easily. Um, and you say, oh, I'm on holiday, it doesn't matter or whatever. But actually like with a bit of planning and a bit of research and a bit of maybe like focused attention on, on where you're going and thinking, well, I'm just gonna do one trip as opposed, like maybe one longer trip um, as opposed to several, uh, I don't know, city breaks that you don't really think about too much which may seem cheap because you're getting a Ryanair flight and it's only 24 pounds but when you get there you're just 
you know, like actually kind of being specific and yeah, focused. So I've two, um, so Zakia, we'll come to you. Thank you. I think I, um, I agree with Catherine and you, Rachel, on all things. As, and I, I always think about myself as a customer. Um, so I grew up with no money. So I've always been really cheap. Like it's very like parting with my money is very hard. And I think it's so I always think like whenever I love a deal and I love a sale. So, you know, I always think with that in my own personal life and try to use those always be mindful of that i think as enterprise as an um, as an operator it's also i think our role to understand that some people may not have um the economical means to be doing all the things that they want to do and so how can we bring our products to them and i think what i found growing up is that the more research I did to get rid of those middlemen, for example, um, the, the more I found a way economically to make it work for me. So I think it may not be a pound that I spend, but it's actually time and effort into planning things for a holiday where, you know, in the past I might have bought something that was prepackaged and ready for me to buy off a shelf. Whereas now, you know, if I still want um to feel like it can be affordable and it can be done for me, then, you know, I know that if I spend time researching, like Carmen said before, you know, doing my research and researching what the options are and who people are, and then really making a choice of who do I choose and why? Is it because of a few pounds more or is it because I adhere to that ethos more than to that one? Um, and so it doesn't have, I think, with that in mind, I, I find that it doesn't have to be that expensive because then you have all the options in front of you and you can really choose. Um, but there was something else I wanted to say and I forgot. Um, but yeah, and like I said, I think as, a, as an organization, I try to think it's our role to put that information as to have that information as available to the customer as possible. So how can a person that is doing that research at home from wherever home is find out about our tours? Um, and how can we work without relying on somebody to market us like and that will take a big percentage or that will make that price um, rise? And again, I think it's also a question of education because, you know, and for people to understand why something is that price and you know because we pay people fairly because like you said recycled materials are a bit more expensive or whatever else um or because conditions are are good and so for example in in a lot of cities here we have free tours or tours even physical tours that advertise as free and, and we do talk about them quite a lot and what it means to actually go on a tour where you don't pay a penny you don't you know to the guide and what that actually means so again going back to the honesty and and the under educating and having those open conversations about all of these products and then to leave it to the customer to make the choice yeah great and i will just say one thing i can see you nikki as well um i i think there's some really simple things as, that we can do as travelers um for for ourselves like just bringing a refillable water bottle and the means to like um if you're like doubtful about the water one with a filter in it so you're not going around just buying water all the time because i've had that experience before when i'm away on holiday and it's like oh i don't have any, you know like just to think about okay i'm going to take my water bottle with me small thing i'm gonna um you know make my own food for the for the journey or whatever so that you're not just buying a sandwich or something else here you know like all these bits and pieces of throw away and then even just those small things like in the morning before you leave having your water bottle and your like for me those moments of just packing for wherever I'm going whatever I'm doing help my help to program me to think about oh yeah actually I don't need this I don't know whatever it is I'm buying right now or just to say oh do you have a local wine I could try or do you have or where's, where was this grown you know or like to think about maybe going to a local shop and asking, you know, just, it's like a little reset. So that's something I wanted to um, mention. 
Uh, Nikki, I'm going to come to you because you had your hand raised, then Carmen, then Catherine. <laughs> Just really quick, a couple more examples because I always find that's helpful when I'm listening to these. Um, as Zakia said, and I'll just like say the number, like, you know, that middle person taking a chunk, like TripAdvisor, Viator, if you go there, they are listing tours of these local tour companies and taking a 20% cut or higher. So you can actually see if you go to Viator, you'll see the name of the company. And this is, you know, not what they want to hear, but you just go to that company, find them, book directly. That makes a huge, huge difference because um, then they also own you as a customer you know, and, and you might spread the word about them. And it, that's just something that's very helpful for tour operators um, that other people don't want to hear in the industry. Um, also looking at, you know, talking about cheap travel, I'm, I'm also hard to part with my money. And, um, you know, eating locally, which is responsible travel because you're bringing money to these local businesses, that's always cheaper. And you can find um, the uh, Unearthed Women, which is an online magazine. They have a series called Feminist Travel Guides, I want to say. And there's just all these like restaurant shops that are all minority owned, female owned, um, no madness tribe, noir travel, all list constantly like people of color owned places all over the world. So if you find these like news and I'm sure even like Carmen, probably you guys have a blog, I'm assuming and list local spots, like find these local companies that are blogging about and putting out content about these local shops. And that's like the most rewarding way to save money on food on a trip. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. And just to say again, we'll put these recommendations into our guide so everyone will have them as listed. Carmen, come to you. <laughs> you need to unmute. Microphone, yeah. 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 <laughs> no, it was just what the Nikki said about locals because it appeared on, on Mentimeter when we were doing the questions before. It was, uh, there was a lot about uh, carbon footprint, but there was so much on the social uh, bucket and, and locals. And if you look at what locals do, that's already a very good um, quality price balance. And, and you're going to find the cheapest options, but it's also what's more interesting on a cultural site. And so um, it depends on how much time you have and, and obviously your the, the, the price you want to pay. But just doing this little research on what's interesting culturally and what do uh, locals do, that leads you to a very good price and very good experience, in my opinion. Brilliant, I love it. And this is research you could be doing on the train when you're traveling slowly to wherever you're going. Um, not on a bike, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> and we had another question. So Amit, sorry, I saw your, here we are. Um, and apologies if I've just pronounced your name incorrectly. Um, so how can tourism enterprises standardize their products to convince, interesting word, slash, educate the customers of the true product value sustainability assurance behind the eco label on offer great question um how can tourism enterprises standardize is it happening is there a way yeah over to you i think it's hard to do that and i think that's why there isn't this wonderful cohesive movement moving forward um because it means something different to everyone because there's varying levels of interest, because there's varying styles of travel. So, you know, to standardize product, I mean, you know, yes, everyone wants to go see the Eiffel Tower. So it's, I, in my ideal world, it's those highlight tours that are actually gonna be the most responsible because they're going to attract the most people. Um, but really what we wanna get people on are places outside of the Eiffel Tower, you know, into those neighborhoods that aren't seeing the money. So I think, it's hard because of that education gap. So someone, again, who's going for the first time to a place, recognizing what they actually wanna see and then marrying that. So I think, I think it's really hard to make it consistent. For sure, maybe we all need to have our own little checklist. Like for me, this, these things are important. And so I'm just gonna check these priorities and I don't know. And then maybe that, if we share those, maybe they cross over and we create our, I don't know, maybe there's, if you are more interested in the social responsibility, you, you use this matrix and we'll sort it out. <laughs> I, I have faith. Um, Catherine, you were saying something in the chat. Did you want to add it? Um, where are we? It was just a very quick point to say that, um, yeah, on the previous point, you don't have to book like an eco lodge to be, you know, staying somewhere sustainable. You can yeah. book a local hotel and chances are it's going to be a lot more sustainable than most. So, um, yeah, it was just my point. You can bring sustainability yourself to the trip. You don't have to book a sustainable trip. If you want to, you can, but yeah. you don't have to. 
yeah, you can be a sustainable traveller and therefore your trip is sustainable. I suppose. Oh, Anne says. Exactly, yeah. Yep, exactly. Thinking about our own. Um, Chantal has mentioned diversity and inclusion. And Nikki, I know you were just touching on that. Is there more that we can, could be doing to um, really promote and um, be mindful of diversity and inclusion? I will keep this brief. Um, I have lots of thoughts on this. I, I think it's, again, emailing those companies. Um, you know, the majority of, at a travel conference, you know, it's really interesting. There's, there's so many female tour operators, um, but very few of them are ever on stage speaking at industry events. And so there's a really lack even within um, the industry side, but on the front side, um, um, many, many tour operators from, and I'm trying to be careful with my words, tour operators in um, English native areas, especially on our side of the world, um, they cater purely to female white um, 60s college educated, like that is who they believe take trips. Um, and that is the one demographic and that is just not true. I mean, I think um, the Nomadist Travel Tribe put out um, a report on the black travel spend and it's like a couple billion dollars in a year, you know? So lots of people travel, but they're not represented. Um, so I would say two things that you could do as a traveler, email those companies as I said, and just to comment, say, hey, I've noticed everyone on your um, website is white, even though you're doing tours to South Africa or to the Caribbean. I've noticed all the guests are white. I've noticed all of the um, guides are white, you know, and adjust it however you will. And then also on the other side, putting pressure on these companies, because again, they think you don't want it. <laughs> um, they think you just want to hear the history that you see in the movies putting pressure on them to ask about these stories. So I don't know, maybe you're booking a highlights tour um, in New York City and, and you wanna say, hey, is this gonna talk about African-American history on this tour? Is this gonna talk about females? Is this gonna talk about modern day immigrants on this Ellen, Ellis Island tour? Um, I kind of, I know I'm putting that on you, but unfortunately the industry, I don't see changing anytime soon until they get consumer, um, pressure. So I feel very, very strongly about that, that that is something that we as travelers need to do because it is, it is not happening anywhere. And it's, it's hard. It's really hard right now. Thank you. Um, Zakia, over to you. Yes. I, I think it's the same as um, making those conscious little efforts that we talked about for sustainability and tourism, for inclusion and diversity too. Um, and I think I, Nikki, I agree 100% on that. I think, for, I'll give you an example. Yesterday I was at a venue, which it was really exciting for the first time, being able to see a venue and be given a tour um, and, you know, having a coffee somewhere. And they had wheelchair access everywhere in the place. But to get to the place, you had to go three steps up. So, and I, and I actually was like, oh, can I speak to somebody about this? Because... It's great that they are like ramps and stuff everywhere. And um, and I'm not a, a wheelchair, you know, user, but even I know, and that really jumped at me. I was like, oh, you know, it's inside, it's everywhere, but to get to your building, I can't, I can't even. And I think um, the more people say that, then the more likely, you know, they are going to do something about it. But as an organization, you know, we're always very conscious and careful to have those conversations around inclusion and diversity and who people are and who do we represent I guess because our story is a bit different and you know when working with our guides we don't want to put words in people's mouths so you know we're also very conscious about giving people the opportunity to have a voice if that's what they want but if that's not what they want to also um let that be but you know I think over the last few years I've also realized that my team is was made up until very recently of only white girls and I probably it was the most ethnically diverse because I have an Arabic um, heritage but you know and I was like oh why is that is that that we're not maybe recruiting in the right places or that our opportunities are not widely you know available or that people don't know about us or is that okay and you know and similarly with our content we do the same you know what else could we include and is it really what we should be doing is that what customers want and I think constantly having that internal chat um, is really really helpful and I think um, 
we talk with other companies, other organizations, and there was um, very interesting things that I never noticed, like how do you cater for somebody, for a blind traveler, for example? And I was part of a conversation. I was like, you know what? I never thought about this before. And yet again, you know, I'm quite conscious of, you know, wheelchair access. Um, and why is that that it's not on my radar and how can it be on my radar a bit more? And I think um, having that check within your organization, with your guides, I think as an organization too, and with your customers every so often, is very very valuable and as a customer doing the same you know and um and when noticing little things be like actually you know um and we did a campaign a few years ago around invisible disabilities which was a big thing um in scotland because we had a little girl who changed the way toilets for disabled access were advertised in the Scottish Parliament. I don't know if you heard about that. So, you know, it wasn't the little man in the wheelchair because she had a disability, but it was invisible. So she was like, I never identify with that because I'm not in a chair and yet I have to use the disabled loo. And so I was like, that is so interesting because, you know, uh, adults have to use changing facilities and disabilities are not maybe, you know, visible and things like that. So having those conversations, I think, is a good start to finding an answer to that. I would Brilliant. say. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, thank you. That's a great story. Um, OK, I'm going to. Oh, somebody's coming into the waiting room now. Um, I'm going to come to the panel for that question I asked you earlier. And I also just want to encourage everyone who's on the call, if you do have anything that you want to share, if you want to share an Instagram handle, or if you want to mention something that you're working on, we've seen a few blogs and podcasts mentioned. Um, if you put them in the chat, we've recorded this and we will um, save the chat as well so we can include anything in our um, in the little guide that we publish afterwards. Um, so please do feel free and don't feel shy. Um, Self-promotion is fine. Um, so um, what was I going to say? Yes. So I'm just going to come back to the panel and ask you all, what's the most exciting thing in this space to be looking forward to? Um, and I'm going to start with Carmen. Sorry, I'm afraid my connection was breaking oh, no. a bit and I couldn't that was the hear worst timing. <laughs> Sorry, I was just saying I was going to come back to you for your um, most uh, exciting, you know, what are you most looking forward to in this um, sustainability sort of space and within this conversation? Just coming back to the question I asked you earlier. Hmm. Um, well, I think um, what I'm most excited about is uh, in the um, future, I'd say, is to see how uh, the impact of my work uh, uh, reflects on, on, on the place I love, that is the place I live in. So, um, Tourism, as I said before, has already a huge impact in Mallorca. That's uh, our main economical um, activity. And just to be able to guide people to this, uh, small businesses, to, to let them know what local culture is like and, and to have them taste local food, uh, uh, especially if it can be uh, obviously um, uh, ecological and many... I don't know, it's, it's just uh, rewarding already and I'm sure it's going to be even more rewarding when I see what their opinion is and how they uh, promote the island and so on with, uh, for their friends. So it's just, uh, I think, myself traveling in a more sustainable way is, uh, is going to be satisfying for me, but having people in Mallorca and lead them to what uh, this other side of Mallorca can be in a sustainable way would be so much uh, satisfaction for myself so yeah welcome everyone to come to Mallorca when you're able and uh, uh, yeah. hopefully can help you around I'm excited about that tell us your um, how do we find you so we have a website mallorcaonfood.com and you can find ourselves also in Facebook and on Instagram so uh, any channel you choose is uh, absolutely fine to contact me and uh, I'll be there to answer your questions to customize your tour if you'd like to or if you book through uh, Catherine at uh, Northfly uh, Travel Club you're also going to have some tours included that are guiding, guided by us so maybe a hike or a food tour and will uh, keep building up some products for, for herself. 
Fantastic, thank you. Um, Catherine, what are you most excited about? Yeah, I'm most excited, I think, about the different, and um, we've kind of touched on all of them in this discussion, which is great, it's what I really hoped would happen, um, is interlinking all the different bits of sustainability, like diversity and inclusion, and all the things that we've spoken about, you know, carbon emissions, but also leakage of economic you know, middlemen taking cuts, all of these things, I feel like we're just starting to put them all together and see how they, they as a system, are not really working to help people. And especially they're not working to help minorities and people who have already been marginalized. So I'm really excited to kind of work with other people who are doing cool things, not just in the travel space, but beyond like social enterprises in destinations and other organizations that are doing really cool things um, and to make travel a way to amplify those voices and to help people find the cool things that are happening in the world. Amazing, thank you. And tell us how to find No Fly Travel Club. Yeah, so you can find us on all social media platforms. We are at No Fly Travel Club, so that's easy. Um, and the website is www.noflytravel.club. So um, yeah, easy to find. Excellent, thank you. And on Our Pledge. Also. And on Our Pledge, yes. www.ourpledge.co.uk. And I think um, Alice has shared the link to your campaign and we will share that in the guide afterwards as well. Uh, Nikki, what are you most excited about? I'm very excited of this emerging trend of the tour guides putting themselves out there as individuals as opposed to through companies. Um, and there's nothing wrong for working for a company, but it's very cool to see them sort of cutting out all those middle people and being very empowered to think of themselves as a business. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to where that takes guides. Brilliant, thank you. And how do we find you? Uh, my site is tripkinetics.com and I write about what makes good tour guides, what makes great tours. And I also have a free course on there um, linked about if you do work in tourism, how you can take these small actions for a huge impact. Fantastic, thank you. Again, we'll put all these in the guide. Um, and finally, Zakia, what are you most excited about? Um, I think what's to come is a lot more collaboration between not only you know people like us and that small group of people who are already conscious of that but also with you know everyone else and i think i even before the pandemic hit we could see sometimes you know um conscious effort of wanting to find out more or that little questioning happening of how can I be more social? How can I be more local? Or how can I be more sustainable? And I think that's only going to grow. And what's exciting is to see what the big companies, like we mentioned before, Amazon, for instance, what can they bring to the table? Because unfortunately, you know, they have the budgets and, and, and the reach that we don't have. And I'm always very, very excited about building those bridges because I feel that if we do want to change things, that's what we need to do. Um, and, and I'm quite hopeful that that will happen more and more. So yeah, watching this space. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I think we can probably wrap up with pockets and um, like lists of things to talk about and think about and take away and be inspired by. Um, we've had some fantastic contributions in the chat. We've got lots of lovely links and recommendations and new people to meet on LinkedIn. And so I'm so pleased that people shared. And um, again, just to sort of circle back to the beginning, but um, a big thank you to Euronews Travel and Marta, Ruth and the team there who enabled us. <laughs> There's your cat back here. Um, to, Here's yeah, you. you enabled us. Here she is, hi. Um, <laughs> still asleep um but yes to thank you for um hosting us on your facebook page i'm really grateful um and for broadcasting and recording the conversation so um yes everyone have a look out for uh, euro news travel um as well so yes lovely hearts appearing um unless anyone has anything else to say just thanks to everyone for joining us, really.